to host him here at Ben Gurion University uh, in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, Professor Galea, please. I have the uh, benefit or the disadvantage of uh, not uh, being a psychologist. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm actually trained as a, a primary care physician. So I, my uh, engagement with the world of PTSD has really been very much from the population health perspective. And uh, that has historically been how I think the contribution that I have uh, tried to make, which is how to think about the burden of trauma in population. So what I'm going to do is to try to give you an overview of how I think it's useful to think about trauma and its consequences and what that means for what we do to mitigate the impact of trauma and its consequences. And although my talk is about post-traumatic stress at the title, as you'll see, I'm going to use this more as an opportunity to talk about trauma more broadly. So as I jump in, I just want to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Karsten Conan, who um, is a colleague which have, who, with whom I've done a lot of this work. So I just want to acknowledge her right up front as being central to a lot of the work that I'm showing. So let me uh, plunge in. So I will start with why we do what we do. And I think uh, whenever we do scientific uh, talks and whenever we do our work in science, it's very easy to forget why we're doing what we're doing. And I think it's important to start this way, uh, even if it may seem a little bit um, obvious, because it helps focus the mind on the questions we want to be asking, let alone on the answers that we are finding. So what do I mean by this? At the end of the day, if you are in this room, since there's no obvious free food, you are here because you care about health and the health of populations. So what you care about is this. You care about dealing with issues like this. I'm going to show you some US uh, headlines. These are, um, these are extraordinary and uh, um, deeply depressing headlines. Nearly one in four, uh, five US women have been uh, sexually assaulted. One in 10 children suffer abuse, um, sexual assault up in the military, something we've dealt with a lot in the US. Um, more globally, uh, dealing with um, uh, issues around uh, refugees, uh, rape, assault, weapons of war in Syria, um, um, and um, in uh, Africa and many other places. So th th these are, th th the burden of trauma is in many ways um, incalculable and highly prevalent worldwide. And a lot of what we do is trying to mitigate these consequences. So we care about populations. We care about populations. I would argue we care about the population of um, your community, your country, and your world. And uh, what you really want to do is to take this population and to say, well, there are a certain number of people with post-traumatic stress disorder in a population, right? Those are the figures in blue. And what we'd like to do is to reduce the number of figures in blue with PTSD so that we actually have fewer people with PTSD in a population. And it's important to remember that that's what we're trying to do because that is in contrast with taking a population and caring only about a subset. So I'm going to come back to this at the end, but I wanted to start by making a pitch that if you're interested in trauma, interested in post-traumatic stress, interested in mental health and physical health consequences of trauma, one needs to keep in mind that we are interested in populations and how we can make populations better and healthier. So that's my first point. Now, let's move on to trauma. And uh, this is a, a subject which is um, um, uh, quite uh, close, if not dear, to Israeli's heart. I realize that, which is in part why there are so many of you interested in this topic. Um, the trauma is highly common. And uh, in the Israeli context, whenever I speak here, I always feel like I don't need to make this point, but uh, I thought it was helpful to also show some data. Um, uh, this is, again, a population, and uh, most studies worldwide suggest that about 90% of people in a population will experience a significant traumatic event at some point in their lives. 90%, anything that's experienced by 90% of people means everybody. And um, it's important to remember that because there is a misconception in the public that trauma is idiosyncratic, it's random, and worse, that it always happens to other people, never happens to you. So like, uh, like divorce, right? It happens to somebody else, not to you. But in fact, it's not true. In fact, they both happen to, to most people. Um, and when one thinks that trauma is ubiquitous, it changes how we approach it. And it, it changes what we might do, the science we might pose, the questions we might ask, and the interventions we might think about in terms of mitigating the consequences of trauma. Um, in high-risk populations, about one in two people 
uh, experience trauma over, over the course of a year, which is, if you think about it, very high. High-risk populations are populations exposed to um, uh, ongoing violence, which is really the case in any number of urban areas all over the world where there is instability, areas where there's political instability. One in two people get, uh, experience a trauma every year. This is from the World Mental Health Survey, which is a large, um, really the largest prevalence survey of mental disorders um, that is uh, um, conducted. I'm happy to be one of the PIs, particularly looking at cities on this. And um, this is the exposure to traumatic events. The reason there are only some countries shaded because the World Mental Health Survey doesn't include all countries, it includes only these countries that are shaded. But the colors, the way to interpret this is the dark, the, I don't know what it is, the dark red means that more than 70% of the population is affected by trauma and the green is less than 55% and the amber is in between. So what you see is most countries are in the red, which is what I told you about before. A um, uh, few countries are in the amber and only a couple of countries are in the green. And the other point is not only that trauma is ubiquitous, not only that most people will experience a traumatic event, is that many people will experience more than one traumatic event in their life. So this is from the same World Mental Health Survey. And the colors say number of traumatic events people experience in their lifetime. So what you see here is, again, the dark is about four to five, and the amber is three to four, etc. And you see most countries are in the red and amber phase, or at least in the purple, which is more than two traumatic events in their life. So the message is, most people experience a traumatic event in their life, and those who do typically experience more than one traumatic event. So this is a high prevalence exposure, and it's something that, as I'm going to get to, affects all aspects of our health. It affects post-traumatic stress disorder, yes, but it also affects many other aspects of mental health and physical health. So before I talk about populations, I just want to make a detour about vulnerability. And um, one of the things that is most compelling about studying trauma for those of us in public health, for those of us who care about improving the health of populations, is that trauma disproportionately affects those who are vulnerable. And this manifests in different ways in different countries. Let me start here in Israel. This is from a study that I did a few years ago with colleagues here in Israel. And this is the prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder um, in Israel. This is uh, Israel pre-67 borders and looking at Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs. And uh, this is after the, um, the second intifada. And what we found in the study is that Arabs, Israeli Arabs, had three times the, the prevalence of post-traumatic stress than did Israeli, Israeli Jews. And um, we did a whole bunch of work to try to figure out why this was. And what you have here is a series of models. This is um, the original odds ratio comparing um, Arabs to Jews, which is about three, which means they're about 200% more likely. And then we took into account a whole bunch of variables and resulted in a 40% reduction, resulting in about the 90% greater likelihood. Now, if you read down here, you'll see that this, the, ink, the persistent 90% greater likelihood of PTSD among Arab, again, Arab Israelis compared to Jewish Israelis persists despite adjusting for sex, age, income, education, religion, direct exposure to trauma, threat from conflict, economic loss, psychosocial loss, traumatic growth, and social support. In other words, it persists despite the fact that we accounted for every variable that we can think of. So why is there such a difference? There is this difference probably because of deeply seated socioeconomic differences that ultimately affect every aspect of life. That Israeli Arabs are much more vulnerable than Israeli, Israeli Jews by way of a burden of ongoing adversity that ultimately manifests whenever you have a traumatic event. So that's a local example. Now let me show you an American example. This is um, um, in the United States, and uh, what you have here is uh, the prevalence of the traumatic event, breaking up the US by white, um, non-Hispanic, black, Asian, and Hispanic. And what I want you to see is child maltreatment, and uh, if, you just, uh, if you just compare, just the easiest is compare Hispanic, black to white. More child maltreatment in minority groups, more muggings in the minority group, more domestic violence here. The only thing that's different is actually unwanted sex and rape, which is actually comparable in whites and Latinos. But in the US, we find disproportionate burden of traumatic events among minority groups, which in the US, these different countries are different. In the United States, race and ethnicity are inextricably linked with socioeconomic disadvantage, in that there is a very, very tight link between um, people of color, blacks or Latinos, and lower socioeconomic um, status.
Um, another aspect of vulnerability is age. So this is the age at which most traumatic events happen. So the way to read this is, this is age, and this is, um, if you look at the yellow, it's interpersonal violence. The purple is accidents, the green is death of a loved one, the, the teal is um, a death in one of your, um, among one of your friends, and witnessing is if you witness a traumatic event. But if you look at the two big ones, the two biggest forms of traumatic events that we all experience are interpersonal violence, which means somebody's beaten up, and accidents. And the arrow is age 21. So age 21 is the arrow, and you can see that 60% of, of the experience of interpersonal violence and accidents happens before age 21. Right, so there's another axis of vulnerability. When we think about trauma, again, if you, if you step outside yourself for a second, and you say, if you were to talk to your mom or grandma, and say, when do people experience trauma? In the, in the common discourse, we tend to think about traumas happening to grown-ups. Well, it does, but actually, the majority of trauma tends to happen to the vulnerable who are children and young people, just like it happens to minorities in the United States, just like it happens to a group that is socioeconomically disadvantaged here in Israel. So third point, trauma and its consequences tends to happen more to vulnerable populations. Now let me move to the consequences of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I, I want to make the point that um, although my talk, as I said at the beginning, was about post-traumatic stress, the consequences of trauma are far broader than post-traumatic stress. And in fact, the consequences of post-traumatic stress itself are extend to a full range of physical illnesses. The reason this is important is because when we think about the consequences of trauma, we frequently ghettoized, to use an American term, trauma with the psychologists and the social workers, and as long as we deal with the psychological consequences of these events, we are going to be okay. It's not true. In fact, the consequences of trauma extend well beyond, well beyond mental health into all aspects of physical health. So let me show you some examples. So first of all, this is, uh, I realize there's a thing in the top right. I'll see if I can close that. There we go, that's cleaner. Um, what this is, is the global dis burden of disability. So A is um, men and B is women. They're roughly the same. But just, just focus on the left, just to make it easy, which is the men. And the way to read this is, um, this is age groups. This is how old people are. And the, the colors represent here, which is what we are losing uh, disability adjusted life years to. So for example, I want you to look at the red you see the red, which is mental behavioral disorders? See, mental behavioral disorders emerge in the late childhood, which is over here, and early adulthood, in the, in the early 20s. You see the enormous burden? Much less in childhood, but they emerge here. If you look at the light blue, that's neonatal disorders. So it's disorders of, of uh, the first month of life, which is actually why it's over here. So that's how to read this. Um, but when you look at this, you'll notice that war and disaster unintentional injuries, transport injuries, mental behavioral disorder, as I'm going to show you, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, all are related to trauma. And when you add all those up, you end up with a majority of the disability-adjusted life years worldwide being linked to trauma. Even if you forget about the physical health cor uh, correlation, even if you forget about cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, if you just count the consequences of war and disasters, unintentional injuries, transport injuries, mental behavioral disorders, you end up with a burden of disability adjusted life years that's bigger than anything else. In fact, putting this in context in terms of cost, I'm not sure how uh, universities or uh, hospitals work in Israel, but in the United States, nobody pays attention to you until you mention cost, and all of a sudden everybody says, oh, now I'm interested. Um, um, so this is the most expensive medical conditions in the United States, and um, on the left is absolute expense, on the right it's relative expense relative to each other, but the two match one to one, so you can just look at the left, which is absolute. The most expensive medical conditions in the United States are heart conditions, and then cancer, and then trauma-related disorders, and then mental disorders. About 70% of those are linked to that. So if you add this and this, you'll see it's more expensive than heart conditions and cancer. Why is that? Trauma is prevalent, mental conditions are prevalent, and when one develops the consequence of trauma, those consequences last throughout a lifetime, right? Which makes for a lot of costs. 
So from a cost point of view, if all you care about is cost, if you don't care about disability adjusted life year, if you don't care about population health, you just care about cost, trauma and its consequences have an extraordinary cost throughout our population. Uh, I don't know if uh, anybody knows Israel numbers, but I see no reason why it would be different than this. Now, let me um, show you a couple of papers that um, I've been involved in that look at how trauma and PTSD are associated with other uh, health conditions. So this is uh, looking at body mass index in the United States. As everybody knows, in the United States we have an obesity epidemic in that we've doubled our obesity rate in the past uh, 25, 30 years. And what this looks at is uh, 1989 all the way to 2005. So what you see here, you see everybody's getting fatter. There are more, more people getting fatter, which is fine. You know that. But, well, it's not fine, but it is what it is for the purpose of this talk. What I want you to look at is um, people without trauma, right here. Uh, people with trauma but no PTSD symptoms. People with trauma and one to three PTSD symptoms. And people with trauma and four plus PTSD symptoms, right? So you have this layering of the consequence of traumatic events. You have trauma, you have trauma and PTSD. You have trauma and PTSD with a lot of symptoms and trauma PTSD with more symptoms. And clearly, you have higher body mass index every year, consistently, every year is the same pattern, and it's all going up, as is the national trend. So clear link between trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder and one physical manifestation, in this case, body mass index. This is now the consequences of obesity. So this is diabetes. So if you look at, uh, this is the cumulative instance of diabetes. This is age groups, right? The diabetes incidence goes up in the late 40s, early 50s. And what you have here is people with no trauma, people with trauma who had no PTSD symptoms, one to three symptoms, four to five symptoms, six or seven symptoms, incidence of diabetes. And that, of course, matches entirely the previous slide I showed you with obesity. So more trauma, more likelihood you are to, go to, to have obesity, more likely you are to have type 2 diabetes. And if the trauma is associated with PTSD, it is heightens the risk for both body mass index as well as diabetes. Um, not just diabetes, I'm gonna show you another illustration. This is moms who experienced abuse as children. And what this is looking at is the likelihood that their children are going to be smoking. So this is uh, moms who had no abuse to moms who had severe abuse. And uh, what you're actually seeing here is kids starting smoking early and um, using a lot of cigarettes versus kids who initiated late with moderate consumption and kids who just experimented. And it, you see very clearly, as the mom's experience of abuse gets worse, the child is more likely to smoke and more likely to smoke earlier and to smoke more. And going back to um, BMI and continuing sticking on the women's experience of abuse as well as their children smoking. So this is now um, kids likelihood of uh, um, um, uh, being overweight. And uh, this is mom's um, experience of abuse. Again, this is moms who were not abused and these are with different levels of symptoms and this is the patterns of weight of their children. So anybody who has um, had children knows that uh, children sort of get skinnier until about they hit 17, 18 and then they go to university and they eat a lot and they get fat. <laughs> not you all, but uh, in, in America. I'm sure it's not the same in Israel. Um, the food here is very slimming. Um, um, the, um, but be that as it may, the, the pattern is, is much the same pattern, right? That with no trauma, you have less weight, and with more trauma and with more symptoms of PTSD, you have more weight gain. All right, so I've made the point, we care about populations. Trauma is ubiquitous in populations. It's particularly problematic in vulnerable groups. And trauma is clearly associated with a whole range of uh, symptoms from mental health to physical health. Now, I've been talking about trauma very generically, so I want to just make a bit of a detour to make the point that not all trauma is equal. And I think it's an important point because sometimes when you're dealing with populations, there is a risk of saying, well, trauma is trauma. What, what, we, what we care about is the, is the overall burden, but it's not true. Not all trauma is created equal. So, this is um, from a recent paper by Rachel Yehuda and her colleagues um, and looks at the prevalence of trauma, which is in the red bar, and the green bar is the prevalence of PTSD, and the yellow bar is not developing PTSD. So if you look at the most prevalent trauma, is you witnessing something, but you not being hurt yourself. So the most prevalent trauma is 
um, you're seeing a car accident in front of you. You're seeing your friend get injured. So it's the most likely, see, because the red bar is highest. It also has the lowest likelihood of PTSD because the green bar is lowest and the highest likelihood of not having post-traumatic stress. And that goes all the way to across all studies. The fortunately the least prevalent of the big traumas, but the one which is most negatively associated with PTSD, which is rape. So rape is the least prevalent in populations, which is about five, seven percent, but it is associated with nearly 50% likelihood of PTSD. Right? And then you have differences in between, you have accidents, threats, this physical attack, child molestation, combat, um, childhood trauma. But rape is across studies, across culture, associated with much greater likelihood of PTSD than anything else. So this is important to keep in mind from the point of view of what is the burden of um, trauma itself, right? which is different in the red bars, and what is the conditional likelihood of post-traumatic stress disorder if one were to have the trauma, which is quite different. Um, I want to show you, this is uh, from um, two studies which um, I've been involved in for quite some time. And uh, just to show them to you by way of contrast, the, in the left-hand column are soldiers in the US. These are National Guard soldiers in the American system. I don't know if you have the same in Israel. I presume you do. We have reserve forces, so it's the people who are enlisted in the, in the military. And then many of those people actually end up volunteering and they do a weekend every couple of months and they're deployed if there's something big happening. And that's what we call our National Guard. And we've been doing a study with the National Guard in Ohio for several years. We also did a study in Detroit. This is, has nothing to do with the, with the military. This is just regular citizens of Detroit. So what you have here is the prevalence of different types of trauma um, in those two populations. So what you see is in, among the Guard, combat is in nearly half of them, right? In the re citizens of Detroit is about 10%. Why is that? Because you actually have citizens of Detroit who have served in the military, right? But obviously much more combat. Um, fire explosion was about 31% in the Guard. Nobody in Detroit had it. Rape, higher in Detroit than it was among people who have served in, in the, uh, um, in, among soldiers. Um, shot and stabbed, higher in Detroit than among soldiers. Um, being mugged, roughly the same. Car accidents, roughly the same. Actually, a lot of these, what you see, is roughly the same. Soldiers were more likely to witness death or human suffering. Yes? Uh, no, they're not all men. No, 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 no about 10% are women. And in Detroit, it's, it's a community center? Mm -hmm. Detroit community center is about 50-50. Yeah. Um, um, oh, you're asking because of the rape. Yeah, um, uh, no, no, it's, uh, uh, in rape, it's not all in women um, uh, in, in, in this sample, um, in, in this particular sample. So that's, uh, I'm showing you this just to compare the burden of trauma in the two populations. So where's PTSD higher? Who thinks it's in the military? Who thinks it's in Detroit? Who doesn't think? <laughs> um, uh, the burden is actually twice as high in Detroit almost. Detroit is 16%. Uh, and um, in the military, it's about 9%. 9% um, is actually not that much higher than the baseline, um, what you expect in the United States in, a, in, in lifetime. It's driven principally by the um, rape as well as um, physical assault. In Detroit. So I'm showing you this because to make the point, not all trauma is equal. And when we think about trauma and its consequences, we need to understand fully the context and understand that the burden of post-traumatic stress can be quite different than we expect it to be just by thinking about sort of people's job affiliation, like being part of the military. Um, the other thing about the military which I want to make in the context here of not all trauma being created equal is in the US. Um, and I don't know if there, this has been a discussion here at all, you can tell me afterwards, but um, there's been quite a bit of um, discussion in the past few years about military sexual assault and military sexual violence. And uh, it's made the papers, as a result there have been congressional hearings and the usual things that happen when something hits the press. And we looked at this among um, um, two samples. One is the Ohio sample that I showed you as well, but as well as another national sample of reservists and National Guard members, which are two different types of reserve forces in the US. They operate slightly differently. But what we looked at was, what is the problem of sexual violence? And we documented the problem of sexual violence. And overall, so this is women, this is men. This goes to your, to your point that it's not, all, it's not only women. Men have a prevalence, much lower. Men is about 5%, while women is about 30 35%. However, what we're looking at here is when does the sexual violence happen? And in fact, the bulk, 
the large majority of the sexual violence that women are experiencing is not during deployment, but in the rest of their life. So this is lifetime sexual violence, this is deployment sexual violence. So in the context of the national conversation in the United States about military sexual violence, military sexual assault, much of the sexual assault that is experienced among military members actually is linked to their civilian life, which goes back to my Detroit military example. So the point here is not all trauma is equal, and we tend to make cognitive errors in some of our simplifications about when and who experiences traumatic events, and trauma in general populations is as burdensome, if not more burdensome, than trauma in specialized populations like military populations. This perhaps might be the most alarming, or at least the most alarming for anybody who has children or anybody who's thinking of having children, um, um, that um, the effect of trauma extends beyond generations. And uh, th there has been a, a line of thinking about this for quite some time. Some of the earliest work on this, which was most, um, I think, persuasive, was actually done among Holocaust survivors. And uh, that work was good, it was typically small samples. Uh, lately, um, some groups have been able to look at bigger samples to really look at What's, what, what does it mean to have trauma in one generation passed on to the next? And by the way, almost all this work is all about moms. It's all about how moms are the ones who are transmitting the effect of trauma beyond generations. Dads, that seems to not to matter very much, but that's probably true in many other aspects of life. But uh, in, in this context, it's mostly about moms. But we can talk about dads afterwards. They matter in some other ways, but not centrally. Um, um, so this is from a study which um, 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 my colleagues had done looking at um, whether moms had post-traumatic stress disorder and their children's likelihood of being exposed to a traumatic event. And the way to read this graph is as follows. This is whether or not mom had any PTSD symptoms, all the way to having six or seven symptoms, okay? And these bars are, if you look at the light bar, the child never experiences a traumatic event, all the way to the child experiences five or more traumatic events. And what I want you to see here is this. As you go from left to right, which means the mom has more post-traumatic stress, there are more children who have more events, right? So as moms, when you have sicker moms, their kids are more likely to experience a traumatic event. Now, you have to stop and think about that, right? Because why should the mom having PTSD have anything to do with the child's experience? Well, when you think about it, there are many reasons why that may be the case. There are child-rearing patterns. There's greater social vulnerability, child's greater exposure to risky behavior, plausibly all of which is linked to parenting patterns and the health of the mother. Now, okay, so mom PTSD, child trauma, but what about the child's PTSD? Does the mom's experience affect what's happening to the child? So this is from a, a parallel paper to this. On the bottom again, you have mom's PTSD symptoms, and what you have now is children's symptoms of PTSD if the child had a traumatic event. Okay, so if the child had a traumatic event on the previous slide, what's the likelihood that the child has PTSD symptoms? And again, same schema, light color to dark color, moms from no PTSD to more PTSD, and what you see is from left to right, you get more and more dark colors. So as the moms have more PTSD, you have greater likelihood of PTSD in the children. Why is this? Same explanations I gave you before, probably also some molecular explanations. Probably there's some epigenetics going on where the exposure to traumatic event is resulting in changing of uh, genetic transcription, which results in a changing phenotype among the children. That's in the US. Here's a study that uh, we did in uh, Liberia, Liberia a country in uh, West Africa. Um, unfortunately, always in the press for bad things happening. Um, we did the study in uh, Nimba County, which is in Northeast Liberia. This is a map of Nimba County. And um, Liberia, for those of you who remember, had uh, a civil war about 25 years ago. It was started by Charles Taylor and the People's, uh, and Lord's Liberation Army entered Liberia from Cote d'Ivoire over here. And they essentially, uh, literally raped and pillaged their way across Nimba County. These are, what these are, are historical dates. So these are battles that happened this way and then kept going all the way down to Monrovia, which is somewhere down here. And Nimba County, after the initial few years of fighting, was actually peaceful during the Civil War. The Civil War was not in Nimba County, it was, it was around Monrovia, around the capital of Liberia. So this fighting happened almost 25 years ago. Okay? And what we did was we went in and did a population-based study a few years ago of Nimba County. And we asked the question, could we detect 
20 years later, a path of trauma? Could we detect a, the consequences of this fighting in the 1990s again in 2010? What we did is we did a population representative sample of the entire Nimba County. And I'm going to show you the burden of PTSD in different villages in Nimba County. And what I'm doing is the villages which had more PTSD, I'm going to make big. The villages which had less PTSD, I'm going to make small. So there, here's the map of burden of PTSD. And what you see is, so these are the small villages, these are the big, and you see the same pattern as you had with the traumatic events. Now, this study was done 20 years later. We did a study of adults 18 years or older. So of course, when you quickly do the math, you realize that there were many people in the study who were children. Some weren't even born when the original trauma happened. But here you have, 20 years later, a burden of PTSD etched in the population um, um, many, many years after the initial trauma happened. Why is that? There are many reasons for it. Trauma has disrupted the local economy, has disrupted social networks, has disrupted uh, economic function, has disrupted social bonds, result in increased violence, all of which manifests in a burden of violence, burden of trauma, and more PTSD today. Here's one more study from Africa. This was in Ethiopia, in southwest Ethiopia, an area which had a fair bit of conflict. And um, this is a number of traumatic events experienced. This particular one looks at depression. And you have, um, um, this is uh, likelihood of depression among women, likelihood of depression among men. Women are more likely to be depressed than men, given a certain number of traumatic events. That's not a surprise. We know that's true for post-traumatic stress. Any number of uh, actually psychological disorders, which we can talk about why that is, very complicated reasons why that is. Um, but more trauma, more depression. But then what I want to show you is this. This is a, an objective assessment of development of the mom's children. So this is not self-report. We're not asking the mom, how is your child doing? We are observing the child. And these are children's ages. What you see is, first of all, all these bars are going up, right? As the child gets older, their development goes up. That's fine, it's what you expect. But then we split the children into two. The group in the white bar, the group in the black bar. The white bar are kids of moms who are not depressed. The black bar are kids of moms who are depressed. And what you see is that as the child gets older, they're always developing more, but the kids of moms who are depressed have slower development than the kids of moms who are not depressed. Of course, child development has extraordinary implications for how a child does throughout her life or his life, including social development, economic possibility, educational uh, uh, potential, all of which is hampered by slower development, which is linked to depression, which is linked to traumatic event exposure. So this message is the consequences of traumatic events, unfortunately, extend beyond generations. And it's not a simple matter of saying there is a traumatic event that happens now, it's affecting us now, but it also influences everything else about you, mental health, physical health, and for moms in particular, the health of their children. So now let me, I'm slowly circling back to where I started with populations. So I'm gonna move on to this uh, question of um, trauma exposure. And I, I would like to argue that most trauma exposure should be preventable. So let me show you what causes trauma exposure in the United States. Um, uh, so what you have here is violence, shared uh, over here accidents, and intimate partner sexual violence and interpersonal violence are 14, 37, and 8 percent, which is more than 50 percent. More than 50 percent of violence are intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and injuries. Or another way of looking at it, more than 50% of violence is intimate partner violence, interpersonal violence, and uh, um, bodily harm being caused by one person to another. There is no reason why sexual violence, intimate partner violence, interpersonal violence, and uh, the cause of bodily harm between one human and another is not preventable. So at least 50% of the burden of traumatic events are preventable. And this um, looks uh, worldwide, same thing. You have war, higher percentage worldwide, but sexual violence, physical violence, um, um, and uh, uh, witnessing violence, 32, 18, that's 50%, 57%. So both in the US and worldwide, and I would expect it to be the same here. Um, the majority of causes of trauma are interpersonal violence, interpersonal harm. A, more than half of that, 
actually is sexual violence. And all of which, as far as I'm concerned, is preventable if we made that a focus of our public health or societal approaches to mitigating the consequences of these events. Um, before I come back to public health, I want to make a, some comments about genes, because um, um, you're all in the health field, and lately, as everybody knows, there is nothing sexier than thinking about genetics. And uh, your genes um, um, matter, and uh, certainly in, in my country, uh, that's what everybody wants to talk about, because uh, we all have this notion that uh, you're going to have a chip, that's your gene chip that's going to tell you exactly what you're going to have, and, um, and uh, you're going to be able to take a drug to fix different parts of you. That's, that's where we're all headed, right? So I want to make the point that um, genes may matter, but environments are inescapable. So let me make this point. Let me start with the point that genes may matter. This is a pretty typical Manhattan plot, for those of you who have not seen these plots. This is a genome-wide association <coughs> study that our group had done. This looks at the, um, at the RORA gene, retinoid-related orphan receptor alpha gene, um, which <coughs> shoots up here. You see it on chromosome 15, which is probably a functional gene somehow associated to protein expression linked to the PTSD phenotype. So there's no question there are particular genes that are associated with PTSD, no question. <coughs> there's also a very interesting body of work looking at epigenetic changes linked to PTSD. So this is, um, again, from another one of our studies, looking at the MEN2C1 um, gene. And the way to read this is as follows. This is methylation of the MEN2C1 and epigenetics, for those of you who haven't done much on it. Essentially, your genes are your genes. Your genes don't change over time. You're born with your same genetic structure. What changes, though, is how much your genes are, how your genes are transcribed, which means how your genes go from DNA to becoming protein. And how your genes are transcribed changes for many, many reasons not the least of which is the protein pattern that is stuck to DNA. And that protein pattern does change. Methylation is one of those protein patterns around DNA that, that affects how DNA is transcribed. So the way to read this is, over here is there's more transcription of, uh, sorry, there's more production of methylation. And uh, the way to read this is, this is likelihood of PTSD, and this is number of traumatic events that people experienced. So just follow this line for a second you see more traumatic events, more PTSD. No surprise there, right? You look at any of these lines, more traumatic events, more PTSD. However, what I want you to see is that this increases with methylation. So although more traumatic events, more PTSD over here, if you have more methylation, you have more likelihood to have PTSD than if you have less methylation. So it's an illustration that genes do matter and epigenetic and biological processes do matter. Both determine your likelihood of having PTSD. So, genes are important. Now, can we therefore focus on genes and say, you know, there was this guy, he came to speak, and he said, most trauma is avoidable, all this you know, sexual violence, interpersonal trauma is all avoidable, but that's all you know, communist speak, so let's not worry about that. Let's focus all our energy on the best possible diagnostics so that we can identify the gene and fix everybody and let people beat each other up as long as we can give them a drug, it's okay. Um, well, I mean, that's not so crazy if you think that's going to work. Um, uh, so let me show you why that's not going to work. Um, um, so let me ask you this question. How much of your risk of getting PTSD if you've been exposed to trauma is determined by your genes? So it's a percent question, right? You can say 100% determined by my genes, 50% determined by my genes, 0% determined by my genes. I want to do a little bit of a poll. Let's divide it into quartiles. How's that? 75 to 100, 50 to 75, 25 to 50, 0 to 25. So who thinks that the risk of PTSD that's determined by your genes, assuming you've been exposed to a traumatic event, is in the 75 to 100%? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's... Now, everybody has to raise their hand, okay? <laughs> At the end, if you don't raise your hand, I'll ask you to raise your hand and just tell me why not. You give me a reason why not. Who thinks it's 50 to 75? Who thinks it's 25 to 50? Okay, who thinks it's 0 to 25? Was there anybody who did not raise their hand? Okay, so you've all made the bet. Many of you are skewing to the lower half, okay, but there is a percent that you have in mind. So let me show you the answer. Let me go back to a population. And here's the nomenclature I'm going to use. 
I'm going to use this nomenclature. The people, when the gray people become black, they have the gene, the gene that makes them PTSD vulnerable. I'm assuming there's one gene. I'm taking the simplest possible scenario. This is not true. There's no question it's not just one gene. There are many genes, but let's just say there's one gene, okay? And people who are in the green are people who are in a positive, supportive context that mitigates the potential consequence of traumatic events, okay? And people who are in the red are the ones who get PTSD, okay? Um, um, I'm sorry, I apologize. I actually, uh, I, I, let me go back. I made a mistake. Uh, I made a mistake here. The people in the green are people who are in an environment that's a negative environment that's going to make for PTSD. Okay, so I apologize. So black is the gene of PTSD. Green means you're in a, let's say, in a disrupted, disruptive environment with high levels of interpersonal violence where you don't have efforts being made to mitigate the consequence of trauma. And if you have red, it means you get PTSD. And the formula here is very simple. If you, get, if you have the gene, which is black, and the environment, which is green, you're going to become red, PTSD, okay? To make it more realistic, I'm going to throw in some random reds, because, you know, sometimes we don't understand the full phenotype, and there are some people who are going to develop PTSD, we don't, they don't quite have the gene, maybe they're not in the wrong environment, but they still get PTSD, that's all. So that's all I'm doing in the simulation, and you can do the simulation at home, you can pull out pen and paper, you can do it right now, it's very simple. So here's the first scenario. First scenario. You have a highly negative environment, say a poor environment, there's a lot of conflict going on, socioeconomic adversity, and here are the people with the gene, those are in the black, I've made them dots just so you can see the black and the green, okay? I have some red people who are random PTSD, but now I'm going to convert the black plus green to give them PTSD. So black plus green becomes red, okay? Now, what's the percent of PTSD, in this case, that's linked to my genes. Well, you can count that, but you, you can look carefully. Do you, know, do you see how everybody who was red was actually in the green, uh, already had the, had the gene? Notice how everybody who was, was red had the, had the black, with the exception of the random people? So if you do the math, the percent of PTSD given the gene is about 300, uh, sorry, the, 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 the relative risk is about 334, and the percent is about one, because everybody who developed PTSD here had the gene. Now, let me show you scenario two. I'm gonna keep the genes exactly the same. I'm not gonna to touch the genes, but I'm gonna change the environment. Scenario two, see this? Same gene pattern, same black, same random PTSD, but the bad environment is only this part now. So now, I'm gonna convert these people who have the gene plus the green into PTSD. Now, what's the relative risk of PTSD given gene? Well, there are actually many people with the gene who don't have PTSD, right? So the relative risk is actually only 1.7, and only about 40% of the PTSD is due to, due to the gene. Notice, I did not change the gene, didn't change the random cases, I didn't change any of my assumptions, was the only thing I changed? The environment. So now let me go back to my question. What percent of your likelihood of PTSD is determined by your genes? Who thinks it's, 50 to, it's 75 to 100? Who thinks it's 50 to 75? Who thinks it's 25 to 50? Who thinks it's zero to 25? Well, the answer is, it depends. It depends on your environment. Because you cannot answer that question without saying, what's the environment? Right, because I can show you an illustration where it's actually 100%. I can show you an illustration where it's 40%, or I can show you an illustration where it's 5%, without changing the genes, without changing the genotype-phenotype relationship at all, just changing the environment. So, the premise is, genes matter. And there's no question about it, genes matter. Molecular processes matter. If you want to spend a career studying genes and molecular processes that are going to cause PTSD, it's an interesting career. I think it's actually going to be a lot of, a lot of novel insight in the next decades on this. But the environment remains inescapable. It doesn't matter how good we get at understanding the genes, as long as environment matters, it is inescapable. So let me now close up and come back to public health. And I want to talk about the implications of ubiquity. So what do you mean by ubiquity? Ubiquity means when something is highly prevalent. So what are the implications of something highly prevalent the way trauma is highly prevalent? 
What are the implications for how we understand the consequences of these traumatic events, like PTSD and all the other symptoms that I showed you about before? And I show you this by way of illustrations from Jeffrey Rose. It's an old graph. And uh, this is not PTSD, this is just a metaphor. So on the x-axis, you have water quality. This is water being hard or water, oops, water being hard or water being soft. And uh, this is standardized mortality rate from cardiovascular disease. And these are villages in the UK. And um, you don't have to be a biostatistician to realize, right, that there is a correlation here. You see it? There's a line going right there, right? Harder the water, the less the standardized mortality. Now, supposing I remove some of these dots, supposing I cover that. Now look at that. Do you see a correlation there? No, right? So, I mean, you can't really make anything of that. Now, why would I just remove half the dots? Is that reasonable? Is that fair? You're like, well, you're playing with data. Well, it's perfectly reasonable if the dots on the left are Wales and the ones on the right are England. Because there are many studies which are done only in Wales. So if you do this study with only these dots, you are going to miss obvious associations. So what's the metaphor? What does it mean for trauma? If trauma is ubiquitous, if you are in a place where all the water is soft, and you do the question and say, is water hardness linked to heart disease, right? You're going to say, no. But if all of a sudden you realize that if you look at the range of water hardness, you're going to see an association, you're like, wow, I've missed that. It's the same with trauma. You actually don't know what the, how healthier a world without trauma would be because trauma is ubiquitous around you. We are here, we are dwelling here, and we don't know what this would look like if we were to extend the curve because we are in a world where there is 90% of people experience traumatic event, where 40% of, there is 40% prevalence of sexual assault. I mean, these are extraordinarily high, these numbers. And we don't know how much better the world would be did we not have those, same as here. So that's the implication of ubiquity. And um, it's my favorite ubiquity metaphor. This is uh, my goldfish. Um, uh, you know, the goldfish can have its own independent thought. It can be a goldfish artist. And, uh, but it doesn't matter how much a goldfish thinks. It doesn't matter what a goldfish does. Everything the goldfish does is affected by the water in the bowl. Right? If the water is dirty, it's going to affect everything the goldfish eats, thinks, drinks, everything. And that's what a ubiquitous force does for us. And if we don't realize that, we run the risk of looking at data in the way you are all looking at that. And now, for those of you who are semi-asleep, you're like just jolting, like, whoa, what is that? What did I miss? Anybody know what that is? No. That's just part of that picture. <laughs> um, right, so you're looking at only a narrow part of the picture. So let me conclude by coming back to the health of populations. So I started off by saying we care about the health of populations, and let me conclude by, by how we may think about mitigating the consequences of trauma. Um, Let's start, go back to populations. So some people are highly exposed to traumatic events. Right? I showed you, in fact, that uh, a large proportion of people have two, three, four traumatic events. So supposing you take the world and you say, okay, the blue people aren't exposed, the red people are exposed, right? And you know that some of these people are going to get post-traumatic stress or something else that's linked to traumatic event exposure. So the excess is the post-traumatic stress. But here's the problem. The problem is this. Are all the X's on the reds? No, right? You see, there are some X's that are on the blue. See here? And in fact, there are some reds who don't have X's. So at the level of likelihood, you all know this. If I'm telling you red is more burden of exposure, right? You're more likely to have PTSD if you're red. But you also realize that likelihood is just likelihood. The reds don't necessarily have PTSD, while some of the blues may still have post-traumatic stress. So now how do we deal with this conceptually? Well, let me just trans translate this into this figure. Supposing this is number of traumatic events, and this is number of people with it, right? So in most things, there are a few people who really have a rough life and they have a lot of trauma. Most people are somewhere in the middle, and a few people have a charmed life and they have much less trauma. So one approach to deal with PTSD in the population is to say, let's just deal with those who are at high risk. Let's deal with those who have um, 
a certain burden of traumatic events who are over here, and let's treat them and make them better. And that is more or less the approach we take, more or less. What that approach is doing is this. It's looking at those people. It's looking at all the red people. What's it missing? What it's, miss what it's missing is all the blue people with X's. There's another approach, which is you take a population, and rather than deal with the high risk, you say, can we shift the curve of the population? Can we have less burden of trauma in the whole population so that the curve looks like that? In so doing, notice that I've, already, I've dealt with the people to the right of this line because they are now to the left of the line. And if we did that, the population health strategy takes this and makes it look like that. Right? So these are two different approaches. One's a population health approach, one's a high-risk approach. And I, I have come to feel that the world is not about one or the other. The world is about both. I think there is a need, and it's important to have people who focus on high-risk individuals, but we so often forget about those who are at lower risk, who represent the bulk of people with pathology. I end with uh, George Orwell, um, um, which is responsibility of every intelligent person is to pay attention to the obvious. Um, um, and I can't help but feel that uh, much of what I've told you is obvious. And um, we don't think about it. We don't think about it anywhere near as frequently as we should, simply because trauma is ubiquitous and its consequences are ubiquitous. And those of you who are here today uh, listening to this talk, it's presumably because you get that at some level. And I suppose it's my job to provoke you a little bit so you can think about this and figure out how some of these principles and perspectives infiltrate what you do in your practice. I will stop there and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks for the great lecture. Um, I, I wonder how the, there's the whole issue of collective trauma. Yes. And your, your, in your lecture, you were focusing mainly about, in terms of exposure, maybe Yes, individual, individual correct. It, we discussed it the morning in another yeah. context, collective trauma. You mentioned Arabs, for example. Yeah. So we have uh, the whole history of in the United States. You have slavery, for example, yeah. etc. So I wonder. Of course, it fits very well with your perspective, but if yeah. you can tell us sure, sure. more yeah. what you think about it. Yeah, no, and that's, um, in some respects, it's a whole other talk. I think it's a very interesting question. Um, um, I'll address it from two ways. There are many different ways of tackling that question. Number one is the, is the issue of um, sort of burden of vulnerability. And I mentioned Arabs in Israel. You mentioned, I mentioned minorities in the United States. Um, I mean, there are many, many parallels here, right? But you're dealing with a population with just a burden of vulnerability that works against the population on all aspects of health promotion. And I think if you think about collective trauma, you can't avoid that in that you can't avoid that you have within populations uh, these groups that are just much more likely to have a higher risk of pathology if a collective trauma happens. So that's aspect A. Aspect B is that a collective or a shared mass traumatic event also frays a lot of aspects of a community that could be protective, that could mitigate against the consequences of traumatic events. So I showed you that a little bit in the Liberia slides. And, um, I think the Liberia slides, and, and I have sort of a whole other presentation which we can get into on that, um, illustrate this notion that when you have a collective trauma, what happens is you are loosening and fraying the bonds of social cohesion, informal social control, norms for healthy behavior that ultimately shape and moderate the how people interact with each other. And all of that becomes greater burden of interpersonal violence, greater burden of vulnerability to trauma if you've had it happen. I guess the third aspect, just so I don't forget this, is history. And um, we did a study after the earthquake in Haiti in, two, in uh, 2010. And um, one of the papers we did on this looked at what's the likelihood of having post-traumatic stress if you were buried in the rubble. Now, I'm claustrophobic, so. I can imagine no fate worse than being like buried in rubble. It's pretty bad, right? So as a traumatic event goes, I think being buried in rubble is pretty bad. So we found a lot of people who actually had absolutely no symptoms after being buried in rubble. And then we looked deeper as to why is that. The people who actually had symptoms, 
were ones who had been buried in rubble, but who had had a prior interpersonal victimization in the few years preceding. So people who already had traumatic event were then much more likely to have a trauma after they experienced this collectively experienced traumatic event. So I actually think collectively experienced trauma, the context that shapes how the trauma is experienced, the extent to which um, that context can be either health promoting or it can be deleterious to your health um, is um, critical. And I think we are going to see an emerging literature about the, how context shapes the risk for the consequence of traumatic events. So thanks for asking that. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's from the Locust series of studies. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious why we don't see um, something related to untoward reproductive events as being related to PTSD. And I'm not talking about mothers who already become mothers and their children develop and we saw mm -hmm. that you showed us really a lovely series of how PTSD and the mothers relates to PTSD and depression in the children. But I'm wondering why we don't see any evidence and I'm sure it's out there somewhere, mm -hmm. of the mothers who don't have children or mothers who have uh, spontaneous abortions yeah. or mothers who have premature children or low birth weight infants, and that cumulative has will uh, un undesirable reproductive events mm -hmm. doesn't get into the, the international statistics for some reason. And I'm yeah. wondering why that is. Yeah, I... Um I, I agree with everything you say, especially except for the one sentence where you said, I mean, you're sure data's out there. I actually don't think we have those data. Um, we, the, the, the no, data, do I don't think so. I, the, data on, um, the data on what I would call the less obvious consequences of traumatic events are pretty sparse. The, the data I'm showing you here about, forget, I'll get back to reproductive events in a second. The data on uh, cardiovascular disease that I'm showing you here, I mean, th there isn't that much on that either. Uh, so I, I agree with you completely. I'll, I'll give you an example in the, in the US in, in my context. Um, I mean, here is a significant traumatic event that's happening in the US all the time, which is violence committed upon racial minorities, including extraordinary high incarceration rate among racial minorities in the US. This is a big problem. I don't know if you've read about it. It's, 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 a, it's a travesty in the United States. We have actually no data on the consequences on, of their spou on their spouses, on reproductive consequences at all of these events. We, we, have, we, we just published a paper last year looking at um, post-traumatic stress and depression in the community as linked to this form of traumatic event experience. So I'm not aware of any data on what you call undesirable reproductive outcomes. I, it, would, it would strike me as implausible that we don't have a burden of undesirable reproductive outcomes, but I'm not aware of any data on it. Strange, isn't it? Um, okay. Yes, uh, yes, it's strange. Uh, we, we could spend another hour talking about the ways in which science goes wrong. <laughs> I enjoyed that topic. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering if you knew what proportion of trauma in the U.S. was related to guns, and how many, ah. and, and if there's any data on how much we sure. can shift that bell curve to the left. Yeah. Great. So this is, see, this is perfect. Perfect segue to this question. Well, uh, we, we, we have very little data on that as well. Um, so here's, so in the US, uh, 32,000 people die from gun violence a year. You're nodding like you know that. You know that? It's a big number. 32,000. <laughs> have you ever heard anybody tell you how many people are injured by gun violence every year? Meaning they have a bullet go through their body? You know, bullet go through your body is a pretty big deal. No, but why, why haven't you heard that number? Why has nobody ever told you that? No, no, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot. No, it's because we actually don't think about it and the data are not there. So I'm not, I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying, you know, you, you hear it's a big number of people who die. You sell them here about the people who are injured. So it's about 100,000 people are injured every year. So three times as many people who die who are injured. So those people, based on the data I showed you earlier, you would expect 25 to 50% of them to have post-traumatic stress disorder. We don't have those data. So I'm, I'm, I, I can give you a back of the envelope calculations of what I would expect. You would expect a burden of PTSD in their loved ones as well. We don't have those data either. And the witnesses. So we don't have any of those data. You would expect consequences in their children. You would expect other kinds of consequences. We don't have those data. Now in the US, uh, part of the, I think, national shame on guns is that we, 
have had no research on guns for the past 25 years because it's been um, not explicitly prohibited, but it has been uh, explicitly discouraged by a particular um, amendment to a 1993 law. Um, now there's an executive order um, uh, from the president which has, in theory, reversed that, although that remains to be seen. Uh, so we don't have those data. Uh, I, could, I, I think I could probably come close to guessing what the burden is based on what we know in other places, but we don't have those data. There's an, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. I, um, I don't know that there's any other way of shifting the curve to the left. It's very clear. The more guns there are, the more people are going to die from guns. Um, in the US, we have this um, cognitive error happening all the time that says, well, it's people with mental illness who are uh, killing people with guns. But of course, the prevalence of mental illness in the US and Canada is exactly the same. And the US has 10 times more people who are killed from guns than does Canada. And it's very simple. It's because when somebody with mental illness who, by the way, have more violence than upon them than the other way around. But leaving that aside, if somebody with mental illness is going to hurt someone in Canada, they use a spoon and a fork. While in the US, they use a, they use a gun. Um, um, so there is, you're not going to shift the curve to the left in the US unless you reduce the number of guns. We actually, if anybody's interested on, in this topic, this is a topic close to my heart. We just have a paper coming out today where we evaluated all the gun legislations in all US states and showed which ones are most effective. That just came out today. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask, maybe in continuation of the guns, yeah. I was interested to see that the, uh, the army service mm -hmm. was relatively low in, yes. in its traumatic place, and I assumed yeah. it would be. And I wondered if you think that's because of the collective context that you were talking about before? Or yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I think. Um, I think it is, it is that. You always have to remember the context as to which the army and the US at a particular point in time, and, and I don't know enough about sort of the IDF and Israel, what people are exposed to. Um, the reality is that 43% um, of that sample were exposed to combat. A much smaller proportion were exposed to a severe traumatic event during combat, right? So it's a large group. When you actually whittle it down, the number of people who actually are exposed to combat is quite a bit lower. You have this protective community. And frankly, they're not out there being mugged in urban areas. And many people who are in the army come from poor, in the US, because we, we don't have um, conscription the way you do, right? One of the, one of the big downsides of that is that the people who serve in the military in the US are people who are poor and come from socioeconomic disadvantage, which results in people who, actually the counterfactual for them is a highly traumatizing counterfactual to begin with. So I think there are many reasons why uh, serving in the military in the US with, with the exception of subgroups, of course, who are really exposed to severe traumatic events, is on the whole protective than being out in a more dangerous civilian environment. Mm -hmm. Sir? Yeah. Is there any correlation or connection between the uh, number of PTSD symptoms and how well you remember the trauma? That's a good question. I, um, I do not know the answer to the question. There, there might be. I, I, I don't know, somebody else in the room might know. I see a head nodding. It, apparently there is. I don't know those data. Maybe you want to answer? Okay. One of the three conditions for PTSD, one of them is that you have trouble remembering that you have been traumatized. Mm -hmm. And the other is that you have intrusion, you have avoidance, and you have uh, you know, the start of the action. Those are the three typical things. So one major uh, contributing factor but but that's not what you're asking you're asking is that what, that's not that's not what i understood your question to be my question is whether you remember better yeah the trauma will you will you have more is that right You're obviously asked a difficult question. I will, I will leave you all to discuss it when I'm gone. <laughs>
Thank you very much.